Hello, my name is Manoj Kesarvani, and I'm an interventional cardiologist here at UC Davis Medical Center. This talk is entitled, Stable Angina Through the Eyes of a Patient. This presentation was originally a part of the team-based learning session for the IMD 420D course. However, I think this presentation can serve as a very high yield lecture for the IMD 420D course prior to the midterm exam, given the additional content described in the lecture. In addition, it is my hope this lecture can be reviewed prior to the final exam in the same course to summarize a large amount of information. And lastly, it might serve as a nice summary of cardiovascular disease if watched in the weeks prior to taking the Simli Step 1 examination. As far as the objectives of this case study, first, it's very important that a student is able to review important content discussed to date including coronary artery disease, 12 lead electrocardiogram interpretation, and stress testing that will be tested on the upcoming midterm exam. This case study will emphasize key concepts associated with the Mr. Stanford case. And of course, it will illustrate the critical importance of understanding basic pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease in the routine care of patients. Let's move on now and discuss the case presentation. History of present illness. Mr. Aggie Davis is a 66-year-old Caucasian man who presents to the Heart Center for further evaluation of chest pain. Several weeks ago, he began to notice retinal sternal pressure provoked by exertion such as climbing one flight of stairs or mowing his 100-foot lawn. The symptom abates five minutes after ceasing the provoking activity. He denies symptoms at rest. In terms of the past medical history, the patient has a known history of essential hypertension as well as type 2 diabetes mellitus. With regard to the social history, the patient is a retired accountant. There's no history of tobacco or alcohol use, but he does smoke marijuana occasionally to help relieve stress. Family history-wise, the patient's father died of a myocardial infarction at age 52. The patient has no known drug allergies. And, regard, and with regard to medications, the patient is on metformin and hydrochlorothiazide. Physical examination, vital signs. The patient is afebrile with a temperature of 37.1 degrees Celsius. His heart rate is 97 beats per minute. Blood pressure is 162 over 95 millimeters of mercury. And restorations are normal at 14 breaths per minute. His oxygen saturation is 98% on room air. On general appearance, the patient is in no acute distress. In particular, he's not in any cardiac distress. He's alert and oriented to person, place, time, and situation. And on neck exam, he has no carotid bruise with a normal carotid upstroke bilaterally. There's also no jugular venous distension and his jugular venous pressure measures approximately six centimeters of water. Focusing more on the cardiovascular exam, it demonstrates regular rate and rhythm. There's a normal S1 and S2 with a physiologic splitting. There are no murmurs, rubs, or clicks. However, the patient does have an S4 gallop. An S4 gallop is typically generated by an atria contracting against a stiffened left ventricle. The lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally with no wheezes, rails, or ronchi, and there's a normal inspiratory to expiratory ratio. The patient's abdomen is soft and symmetric with no tenderness to palpation and normal bowel sounds. There's no abdominal bruit appreciated or hepatosplenomegaly or masses. With regard to the patient's extremities, there's no clubbing, cyanosis, or lower extremity edema. There are two plus palpable 
bilateral radial dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial pulses. Neurologically, grossly, there are no focal deficits. Not mentioned here in terms of the size is a patient's skin exam. The patient's skin exam is unremarkable and there are no findings suggestive of hyperlipidemia or more specifically familial hypercholesterolemia such as thickening of the Achilles tendon bilaterally or corners arcuae that are sometimes noted when looking at the eyes. So the question posed here in terms of clinical decision making is what features on physical exam in this patient might suggest myocardial ischemia? Now I'd like to take a moment here to explain that Using this presentation to the utmost would mean being able to answer many of the clinical decision-making questions in a manner that's very coherent and using the material that you have already learned in previous lectures. So I will pause for a moment in time. As you're watching this lecture, obviously you can pause the recording to think about the answer to this question. But again, when reviewing this, prior to your midterm examination, prior to your final examination, and possibly prior to you simply step one, it would be helpful to just take a moment to see if you can answer these questions. So on physical examination, when you're trying to determine signs on physical exam that might be suggesting myocardial ischemia, one thing that we might look for are signs of decreased systolic function. This can be evident with a dyskinetic apical pulse, excuse me, impulse. What is meant by a dyskinetic apical impulse is an uncoordinated, otherwise dyskinetic apex beat involving a larger area than normal. So the point of maximal impulse will be larger. It may seem more like a half dollar as opposed to being a quarter in size. Now moving on here, when we think about diastolic compliance, myocardial ischemia can result in a decrease in diastolic compliance as we will talk about when later on in these slides we review the ischemic cascade. A decrease in diastolic compliance can result in pulmonary congestion as a decrease in systolic function can as well. And so on pulmonary exam, a patient may have wet crackles or rails. Now going back to a decrease in diastolic compliance, a patient can also have a S4 gallop as a result of this. Typically, however, patients will have long setting hypertension that will result in a stiffened left ventricle such that the atria, when contracting against a stiffened left ventricle, specifically the left atrium contracting against a left ventricle, will produce an S4 gallop, which again is a pre-systolic sound. It's occurring just immediately prior to S1. Patients also can have papillary muscle dysfunction related to myocardial ischemia. That is because of the fact that the anterior medial and posterior, excuse me, that is because the anterior lateral and the posterior medial papillary muscles have a very characteristic coronary artery supply which can be compromised in the setting of myocardial ischemia. And this may result in myocardial, excuse me, in mitral regurgitation. This may result in mitral regurgitation. Patients with myocardial ischemia will also have an increase in sympathetic tone, such that they will, on exam, have diaphoresis, an increase in heart rate, or an increase in blood pressure. The importance of this slide is to illustrate again that there are many characteristic findings on physical exam that can be suggestive of myocardial ischemia. I'd also like to take a moment to point out that on physical exam, if any of these signs are evident and if this were an ischemia was not explored in terms of the history, it's very important to go back in history and explore relevant questions with the patient. It's important to use a history and physical exam together so that you can perform a proper physical exam based on a working diagnosis that develops in terms of the history. Now some more clinical decision making. Based on history and physical examination, develop a differential diagnosis. Now this is very, very key. It's very important to think about systems 
in terms of a patient's symptom presentation and develop a differential diagnosis that's comprehensive. Now would be a good time to pause the video to think about this differential diagnosis. Now, in terms of the differential diagnosis, there were many features on history that are very suggestive of coronary artery disease. The fact the patient is describing rectal sternal chest pressure, so the location is suggestive of ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease. In addition, the pain is brought on, or pressure sensation rather, is brought on with exertion and is relieved by rest. These are all features, as we'll see in the subsequent slides, that are suggestive of typical angina. Now, whenever considering a diagnosis of ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease, it's very important to determine whether a patient is suffering from an acute coronary syndrome because the management is very different in stable angina versus the spectrum of diseases that incorporate or encompass an acute coronary syndrome. This includes unstable angina, a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, and an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Typically, we are thinking about an acute coronary syndrome when a patient describes an increase in terms of intensity, frequency, or duration in terms of the chest pain syndrome a patient is experiencing. A patient may also have Prince Mendel's or vasospastic angina that may mimic traditional atherosclerosis as a cause of coronary artery disease. Let's explore this in more detail in terms of pathophysiologic findings. Stable angina is a chronic pattern of transient angina pectoris precipitated by physical activity or emotional upset. It's relieved by rest within a few minutes typically, and episodes are often associated with temporary depression of the SD segment, but permanent myocardial damage does not result. That's very important to understand, that if there was permanent myocardial damage associated with stable angina, then it is not stable angina. Then one must consider an acute coronary syndrome. In stable angina, there is no recent increase in terms of intensity, frequency, or duration of symptoms. This is in contrast to unstable angina, which is part of a spectrum of acute coronary syndromes characterized by acute myocardial ischemia. Most commonly, acute coronary syndromes result from either plaque rupture, most commonly, or superficial erosion, excuse me, superficial erosion. Both are associated with thrombus formation. In the case of plaque rupture, patients frequently have a vulnerable plaque characterized by a thin fibrous cap, atheroma, with a necrotic core that ruptures and results in thrombus formation as shown here. Again, here's thrombus formation. But this concept of a vulnerable plaque and the idea of plaque rupture and plaque erosion is very important because that's what distinguishes an acute coronary syndrome from stable angina. In stable angina, there's a stable plaque. There is no plaque rupture or an associated thrombus. Now, myocardial infarction, whether it's a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, refers to a region of myocardial necrosis usually caused by prolonged cessation of blood supply. It most often results from acute thrombus at the site of coronary atherosclerotic stenosis. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it may be a first clinical manifestation of ischemic heart disease, or there may be a history of angina. I think it's very important to understand that myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease, very much so can be a silent killer in the sense that an acute coronary syndrome can be the first presentation of ischemic heart disease. And so it's very important to identify risk factors in a patient and to target them such that one can reduce the risk of ischemic heart disease in a patient. Finally,
Patients can have Prince Metals or variant angina or vasospastic angina. Typically, this is in the setting of having some atherosclerosis, which will cause a patient to have endothelial dysfunction and develop coronary spasm. This can be excuse me, precipitated by cold weather at times, and patients will describe a substernal chest discomfort. Now, in developing a differential diagnosis, there can be other causes of chest discomfort that are still related to the heart and the coronary vessels. However, in this case of coronary mycovascular disease, as the name suggests, there's disease involving the pre-arterials and the arterioles. And this is typically mediated through endothelial dysfunction. This can be a difficult diagnosis to establish, but there are certain non-invasive stress imaging modalities that can help establish the diagnosis. I would like to take a moment here, though, to mention that chest pain associated with myocardial ischemia is usually described as a discomfort rather than a discrete pain. And it's usually a gradual onset. It's usually diffuse rather than focal, so we're not expecting a patient to be able to point out the exact location of their pain with just one finger. It's often felt as a retrosternal squeezing, tightness, pressure, constriction, strangling, burning, fullness. Patients may also describe it as a band-like sensation, a knot or weight on the chest, an elephant standing on one's chest, and it may radiate to the neck, jaw, back, or arms, lasting for a few minutes, typically less than 10 minutes, exacerbated by exertion or emotional stress, and resolved with rest, or sublingual nitroglycerin or some other antianginal therapy. Patients can also have other entities related to the coronary vessels that can result in chest pain. Patients can have a myocardial bridge, for example. So the left anterior descending artery typically is involved. The left anterior descending artery usually courses on the epicardium, on the surface of the heart. But there are parts of the left anterior descending artery as it provides the septal perforator branches such that it courses within the myocardium. And so during systolic contraction or during systole, there can be compression of the myocardial vessel on the left anterior descending artery. But remember, the coronary vessels or the myocardium or myocardial cells are being perfused during diastole. But nonetheless, if a patient is having significant systolic compression, this may result in myocardial ischemia. There are many approaches to deal with this problem that are beyond the scope of this course. Patients may also have anomalous coronary vessels, such that the coronary vessels, for example, a right coronary artery, or more commonly a left circumflex artery, a left circumflex artery, let's take this example, can arise from the right coronary cusp such that it's coursing between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So when a patient exercises, there can be compression on the anomalous left circumflex artery that causes myocardial ischemia. A left circumflex artery arising from a right coronary cusp is among the most common causes of anomalous coronary vessels. Patients may also have inflammatory causes of chest discomfort, such as myopericarditis. Pericarditis, as you know, is usually a diffuse, sharp, pleuritic pain, worse with inspiration or coughing, that is positional, typically worse when supine, but improved by sitting forward, lasting for hours to days. The pain is sometimes described as dull or oppressive. So patients can develop pericarditis related to inflammation of the pericardial space, that inflammation can also sometimes involve the myocardium, in which case there can be a release of cardiac biomarkers such as high sensitive cardiac troponin T that can result in a pattern that's better described as myopericarditis. Patients can also develop pleuritis of pleurisy. So the pleural space surrounding the lungs can also get inflamed, where patients will also describe a sharp pleuritic type of pain. Now let's move on to gastrointestinal causes.
This includes gastroesophageal reflux disease, esophageal spasm, and other motility issues, as well as peptic ulcer disease. So when we think about gastroesophageal reflux disease, typically patients will report retrosternal burning, it's precipitated by certain foods, worsened by supine position, and relieved by an acid. With esophageal spasm, similarly, it's a retrosternal pain, but it's often accompanied by dysphagia. It also is precipitated by meals, and it can be relieved by nitro nitroglycerin because of the fact that nitroglycerin will have an effect in terms of the smooth or striated muscles involving the esophagus. And then with regard to peptic ulcer disease, patients will typically describe epi an epigastric ache or burning. This pain occurs after meals and to relieve by antacids, and typically not relieved by nitroglycerin. What really distinguishes gastrointestinal causes of pain versus myocardial ischemia is the fact that gastroesophageal reflux disease, peptic ulcer disease, esophageal spasm, none of these are affected by exertion. Now, another entity is not listed here is biliary colic. Patients who have biliary colic have a constant deep pain in the right upper quadrant. It can last for hours. It's typically brought on by fatty foods. And it's not relieved by an acids or nitroglycerin. Again, it's unaffected by exertion. Now, pulmonary causes can also result in chest discomfort. An atypical pneumonia, for example, a pneumonia caused by mycoplasma pneumoniae can cause a syndrome that may mimic myocardial ischemia. Certainly pulmonary embolism. A patient can suffer pulmonary embolism and have an exertional component to their pain. Typically though, patients who have a pulmonary embolism will describe a pleuritic pain, a pain worse with taking a deep breath. Similarly, a pneumothorax can also cause discomfort when taking a deep breath. Musculoskeletal causes of discomfort cannot be ignored. Costochondritis, sometimes referred to as costochondral syndrome, is a sternal pain worsened by chest movement. So the key here is that that pain is worse by moving the chest wall in certain positions. The costochondral junctions are tender to palpation in costochondral syndrome or costochondritis. And this pain associated with costochondritis is relieved by anti-inflammatory drugs, not by nitroglycerin typically. Patients also can have cervical radiculitis. This is a constant ache or shooting pain that may be in a dermatome distribution. It's also worsened by neck motion. Herpes zoster can also result in a dermatomal distribution of chest discomfort. Patients typically will initially have a zoster rash, and then after the rash clears, they'll develop the neurogenic pain associated with this diagnosis. Now let's move on and look at the EKG. You're asked here to please interpret this EKG. So why don't you take a second here and do that. Feel free to pause the video in order to do so. I will make a comment here that I didn't mention in the previous slide, and I should do so, is that when patients do have costochondritis, a musculoskeletal cause, of chest discomfort, it's usually reproducible palpation. So it's very important in physical exam to palpate the chest wall to see if that's the case. Now coming back to the EKG, you've taken a moment now to pause and review this EKG. And when we think about interpreting EKG, we want to think about it in terms of following this algorithm. We want to first think about the rhythm. Is there a P wave associated with every QRS complex? And is there a QRS complex associated with every P wave? We also want to look at the inferior leads, leads 2, 3, and AVF to see if the P waves are upright, which would suggest that the origin is from the sinus node. That's the origin of atrial activity. We also want to look at the heart rate. So there are two techniques as you learn in your EKG workshop to be able to determine this.
You can look at the number of beats on a rhythm strip and multiply by six, or you can use a count-out technique. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. Then we want to look at intervals. The key intervals to look at are the PR interval, the QRS duration, and the QT or QT corrected interval. We also want to pay attention to the mean QRS axis, as shown in the diagram here. We have lead one pointing in this direction, lead two pointing in this direction, and lead three pointing in this direction, and the remainder of the leads as shown in this vector diagram. Chamber enlargement. You want to think about whether there's evidence of right or left atrial enlargement, or if there's right or left ventricular hypertrophy. In this course, we have not asked you to think about right ventricular hypertrophy. We want you to focus on left ventricular hypertrophy. Q waves. Q waves are a negative depolarization after the P wave. They're pathologic when they are greater than 25% of the total QRS amplitude, and also when they're greater than one small box wide. We also want to pay attention to see if there are any ST segment or T wave abnormalities. We want to be systematic in this. We want to look at each one of the leads to see if there are any ST segment or T wave changes. And of course, it's very important in real practice to compare the current EKG to a prior EKG if available. So going back to the EKG, Let's work through all of these various components. So, let's first think about the rate. So, even before rate, actually, we should think about rhythm. So we're looking to see if there's a P wave before every QRS and a QRS is with every P wave. And I think as you look at the rhythm strip lead two that we're really focusing in on, you will see that there's a P wave associated with every QRS and a QRS associated with every P wave. Before I'm actually committing to normal sinus rhythm though, I'm actually making sure that the leads are upright in leads two, three, and AVF for the P waves. So the P waves are upright in two, three, and AVF. So I'm really thinking that this is normal sinus rhythm. But I need to look, about, look at the rate to determine whether this is sinus tachycardia or normal sinus rhythm, or sinus bradycardia. So like we talked about, you can count the number of QRS complexes and multiply by six. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, multiplied by six. So the heart rate here using that technique would be about 66 beats per minute. The alternative technique is to find a QRS complex that lands on one of the dark red lines, which would be really this QRS complex, uh, it's slightly before it, but it's close to it. So then the count-out technique, 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. And so we know it's a little bit faster than 60 because of the fact that this QRS is a little bit behind the dark line, so this actually would be moved up a little bit if we adjusted it. So by both techniques, we're getting a heart rate that's roughly in the 66 feet per minute range. Now, we're going to look at intervals. We're going to look at the PR interval, the QRS duration, and the QT or QT corrected interval. So I focus typically on the inferior leads when I'm looking at the PR interval. And here, looking at the onset of the P wave to the onset of the QRS, the PR interval here is definitely less than 200 milliseconds, so it's normal. Now the QRS duration, we're concerned that a QRS is wide if it's greater than 120 milliseconds. And I'm looking here again at the, at the um, limb leads, but looking at the beat chordial leads as well. The QRS duration here is clearly not greater than 120 milliseconds. And then I'm looking at the QT interval. And I would, bring, I would use my calipers and actually measure it out. But a general rule is if the heart rate is 60 beats per minute and the QT interval is less than half the R to R interval, then the QD interval is normal. But we actually could measure the QT interval with our calipers and then use a formula to correct the QT interval for the heart rate. And generally, if it's less than 500 milliseconds, that's normal. But in a normal population, the range of normal for a QT interval, um, the upper limits can be as 
as low as 460 milliseconds. This is not something that will be heavily emphasized in the course. However, it's important to be able to recognize a QT corrected in greater than 500 milliseconds as being prolonged. Now we're going to look at the mean QRS axis. Now the QRS axis is upright in lead 1, it's upright in 2, it's upright in 3 in AVF, so it must be in a normal QRS axis. However, if it was upright in lead 1, negative in lead 2, as well as potentially negative in 3 in AVF, but really want to just pay attention to leads 1 and 2, again, if it was upright in leads 1 and downright in lead 2, that would suggest left axis deviation. Now, if it was upright in lead 2, but downright in lead 1, that would suggest right axis deviation. And if it was downright in lead 1 and 2, that would suggest extreme right axis deviation, or what's called a northwest axis. So this is a quick and dirty technique to be able to determine whether the axis is normal or not, which is reasonable to use on a clinical exam, or a midterm exam, or final exam, as in this course. However, we really want you to think about the vector analysis and be able to actually pick out the angle uh, for which the QRS is actually pointing at. And so general rules in terms of doing that are looking at leads where there's an isoelectric point. So the isoelectric point uh, for a lead would be where the, the top portion and the bottom portion above the isoelectric line are roughly equal. And so if you're able to identify a lead like that, then you know that the axis is orthogonal. It's 90 degrees to that lead. And then you can look at lead one or two to see whether it's pointing in the same direction. For further information on QRS axis, please refer to the EKG workshop that I led uh, where you can watch the video where we discuss this in more detail. So after mean QRS axis, we're going to start looking at chamber enlargement. We're first going to look for evidence of right atrial enlargement. So one rule to look at is in lead 2, we want to see if the P wave amplitude is greater than 2.5 small boxes tall. And it is not, so there's no evidence of right atrial enlargement. Now we're going to move from the left side of the EKG to the right side of the EKG, where now we're going to focus on left atrial enlargement. And so in a normal patient, the P wave is going to be biphasic. And so the top portion represents a right atrial contribution. The negative portion, the latter portion, represents a left atrial contribution. If it's one small box wide, one small box tall, then that's going to be consistent with left atrial enlargement. Again, refer to the EKG workshop lecture for more information in terms of this, but there's no evidence of left atrial enlargement. Also in the EKG workshop that I led, we talked about other evidence of left atrial enlargement, like M mitrali, and again, refer to the video for more information in terms of that. So again, there's no right atrial or left atrial enlargement. Now we're going to look for evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. So the criteria that we want you to be aware of in this course is we want you to look at leads V1 or V2 and leads V5 and V6. Now, if the S wave in lead V1 or the S wave in lead V2 plus the R wave in V5 or V6 is greater than 35 millimeters in a patient older than 40 years of age, that patient has left ventricular hypertrophy. The other criteria we want you to be aware of if, is an AVL. If the R wave in AVL is greater than 11 millimeters, that's also consistent with left ventricular hypertrophy. That's a very specific binding of left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, if one was to look in various textbooks, the internet, you will see that there are many other criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy, but these two are the ones that we really want you to pay attention to. Now, we're not going to focus on right ventricular hypertrophy. That's not something we're going to emphasize in this course. Now, moving on, Q waves, we're going to look at each one of these leads to see if there's a negative depolarization after the P wave. And if you look at least three in AVF, there are tiny Q waves, but these are non-pathologic. They're not greater than 25% the total amplitude of the QRS complex, and they're not greater than one small box tall. And if we continue looking at all the leads, we really do not see any significant Q waves. And then also systematically, we are going to look for any ST segment or T wave abnormalities. So we're going to go through all of these leads here, 
And we see in Li3, there's a T wave abnormality. We also notice one in AVR. And we're moving on, and we don't see any other T wave abnormalities, but it is no a normal finding to see a T wave inversion leads AVR as well as lead 3. These are not contiguous leads. The contiguous leads with lead 3 would be lead 2 and leads AVF, and that's why we're not considering myocardial ischemia in this patient. I should also mention that T wave findings that really suggest myocardial ischemia are of T wave inversions that are typically symmetric. This T wave inversion is not symmetric. And usually it's T wave amplitude that's greater than at least one millimeter. So moving through EKG interpretation, we've gone through each of these things as shown here. Uh, and of course, we want to compare it to a prior EKG if available. So the question here becomes, how does the EKG influence your differential diagnosis? So I'll allow you to take a moment to think about that, pause the video as needed. But the answer to this question is that if we're concerned about stable angina, we have a working diagnosis of a stable angina, a normal EKG does not rule out the possibility of ischemic heart disease. In fact, in a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, that would be the setting of an acute coronary syndrome, a normal EKG does not rule out that possibility either. And so an EKG is still helpful because if we do see signs of myocardial ischemia, and certainly if we see signs of ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or an injury current on the EKG, we need to act appropriately. So an EKG, again, is a very helpful tool, but it does not alone necessarily rule out ischemic heart disease. So the next question is, what factors contribute to the decision to pursue a specific type of stress test in a given patient? So this is a challenging question, as you may have encountered if you've done quiz one, quiz two now, as well as a Mr. Stanford case. But I hope through the lectures, as well as actually attending the team-based learning session in person, that the answer to this question is, is now obvious. However, we'll go into detail in this recorded lecture as well. So take a moment to think about this. Think about what factors contribute to the decision to pursue a specific type of stress test in a given patient. So to answer this question, we need to think about the clinical classification of chest pain. So the clinical classification of chest pain comes into three categories. The first category is typical angina or definite angina. So for a patient to be defined as having typical angina, they need to meet all three criteria listed here. So this typical angina is defined as substernal chest pain or discomfort. It's provoked by exertion or emotional stress and it's relieved by rest and a nitroglycerin. So again, a patient needs to meet all three of these criteria for their chest pain syndrome to be described as typical or definite angina. Now, atypical angina, a probable angina, is chest pain or discomfort that lacks one of the characteristics of the definite or typical angina category. So a patient is gonna meet two of the three criteria as listed here. And if that's the case, then the patient has atypical angina. And then we have non-anginal chest pain. Non-anginal chest pain refers to chest pain or discomfort that meets one or none of the typical angina characteristics. So again, a patient is going to meet one of the criteria or none. So again, whenever we're thinking about a stress test, we first need to classify that patient's chest pain as whether it's typical angina, atypical angina, or non-anginal chest pain. The next thing we need to think about is we need to think about the pretest probability of coronary artery disease. And this is based on three simple features. It's based on age, sex, and the clinical classification of chest pain. So when we do that, for a given patient, we're going to look at their age, their gender, or sex, and the clinical classification of chest pain. So if we think about this patient, this patient is greater than 60 years of age, He's male, and he does meet the criteria for typical or definite angina. So his pretest probability is high. That means his pretest probability for coronary artery disease is greater than 
A patient that has intermediate pretest probability, it's a large category, it extends from 10 to 90%. And a patient that meets a low criteria or low pretest probability for coronary artery disease is one where the pretest probability is 5 to 10%, and then very low is less than 5%. So you can see here a patient that's young, less than 39 years of age, that has non angial chest pain, well, they're going to be low. If, they have, if they're male, I should say, if they're male. Now, if they have atypical probable angina pectoris, then they're intermediate. But even if they have typical angina and they're male and less than 39 years of age, their pretest probability is still intermediate. So this is a table that I want you to become very familiar with. I think the key here for you as a second year medical student and for the purpose of this course, as well as for you simile step one is to recognize what patients are really going to meet the bill of high pretest probability of coronary artery disease. And it definitely is going to be a male patient that's greater than 60 years of age that has typical angina. And that's also true of even women as well. But you can see here, if you're a male between 50 to 59 years of age, you still remain in the high pretest probability category compared to a woman. So again, think about this table. You don't need to memorize every feature of this table, but you do need to recognize what patients are really going to meet the criteria for high pretest probability of coronary artery disease. Now we also have to think about this in terms of Bayes' theorem. So this is something you're very familiar from in your biostatistics course. So Bayes' theorem, in its simplest form, refers to the fact that the post-test probability of a disease is influenced by the pre-test probability. So the post-test probability of a disease is influenced by the pre-test probability. And so that's why it's so important in a patient that has a chest pain syndrome to determine what the pre-test probability of coronary artery disease is so the appropriate test is chosen to help make the diagnosis of ischemic or coronary artery disease. So looking at this figure, on the x-axis we have pretest probability, on the y-axis we have post-test probability for a given hypothetical stress test related to the heart. And we have this dotted line here representing the patient's pretest probability of coronary artery disease. And so if a patient, for example, has a high pretest probability of coronary artery disease, let's say here in the example about 90% here, they're falling on this line. And let's say they underwent an exercise stress test, exercise treadmill test, let's say, for example, and they had a positive result, the likelihood ratio would bring this patient up to here. So their post-test probability is now here. So it's moved up slightly. Now, if they had a negative stress test result, then their post-test probability based on the likelihood ratio would go down here. But you can see here that when you have high test pretest probability and you choose a test, uh, as I mentioned, like an exercise treadmill test, you're not seeing much of a change, actually, even if you have a positive result. And particularly if you have a negative result, your post-test probability for coronary artery disease still remains high. So it makes you nervous about the negative predictive value of a test. This is not something that I want to heavily emphasize here, but I do want you to be familiar with the idea of Bayes' theorem, that the post-test probability of a disease is influenced by the pretest probability. It governs what we do in cardiology, but it also governs what we do in many other fields of medicine as far as why we order certain tests. So coming back to our patient, clinical decision making. Given Mr. Aggie Davis's pretest probability for coronary artery disease, what is the next best step in management to help confirm the diagnosis? So take a moment to think about the answer to this question. Think about the patient's clinical characterization of his chest pain. Think about his pretest probability and determine what would be the appropriate stress test to perform. So in the evaluation of coronary artery disease, the options include several. 
So one option is an exercise treadmill test, or what's sometimes referred to as an exercise tolerance test. It can give a lot of valuable information because not only are you looking at the resting EKG and the EKG with exercise, but we're looking at the heart rate, the blood pressure, whether a patient develops symptoms. We want to try to reproduce the patient's symptoms if they're having symptoms with exertion. And we're going to put all that information together to determine whether a patient has a highly abnormal stress test. In patients that have higher pretest probability than intermediate, we really think about stress imaging. So again, an exercise treadmill or tolerance test is a really good test in a patient that has maybe low likelihood or low pretest probability for coronary artery disease. But when a patient's starting to have intermediate or high pretest probability for coronary artery disease, then stress imaging is a better option. We can do that with exercise. So we can do a treadmill stress echocardiogram. We can also do a treadmill cardiac spec study. This is also referred to a nuclear stress test that Dr. Tom Smith talked about in his nuclear, excuse me, in his imaging talk. Again, a, tre a treadmill cardiac spec study, a type of nuclear stress test. A cardiac PET study is another form of this. Some patients aren't able to exercise, so we need to think about stress testing without exercise. I really want to emphasize that we always prefer doing stress testing with exercise if a patient's able to exercise because there's a lot of additional information we can gather that can be very helpful to determine if a patient has truly had an abnormal stress test. So when we do stress tests without exercise, we can even do cardiac magnetic resonance imaging with vasodilator stress. We can do a cardiac spec study with vasodilator stress, but we also can do it with dobutamine. We can do a cardiac PET study with vasodilator stress. I should mention, I incorrectly mentioned, a cardiac PET study when I was talking about a car treadmill cardiac spec study. It's important to understand because a PET study is looking at metabolic activity. It cannot be done with exercise, so it can only be done without exercise. Patients can also undergo a dobutamine, a vasodilator stress echocardiogram. We don't expect you to understand all the variations of the types of stress tests. We just want you to understand broad categories. So we want you to understand that there's an exercise treadmill test that doesn't involve any imaging. It just involves the EKG, looking at the heart rate, looking at the blood pressure response to exercise and whether a patient has symptoms. And then there are more sophisticated tests that involve stress imaging. And really the two major categories of image, stress imaging while you think about is a treadmill stress echocardiogram and a cardiac spec study, also known as a nuclear stress test. And then we also want you to think about the ischemic cascade. There's a very stereotypical pattern of changes that need to take place before a patient will develop angina. Generally, a patient will have a flow maldistribution that will ultimately result in hyperperfusion. Then they will have diastolic dysfunction. So they'll have a problem in the relaxation of the myocardium. They will then develop systolic dysfunction. So they'll have a problem with contractile function, thickening of the left ventricle. They will then develop EKG changes, ECG changes, and then finally they'll develop angina. So the various stress imaging modalities we have look at various portions of the ischemic cascade. So a nuclear stress test is looking for signs of hypoperfusion. An echocardiogram is looking for systolic dysfunction. And an exercise treadmill test is looking for EKG changes. Now, these stress testing imaging modalities we've talked about, as well as the exercise tolerance test or treadmill test, are referred to as functional assessment of ischemic heart disease. All functional studies reveal the presence of ischemia, but some can provide information on the coronary blood flow and the development of wall motion abnormalities. But again, all functions reveal the presence of ischemia. Whereas we have anatomic assessments, where we're actually trying to identify if there is a blockage in the artery by directly looking and seeing if there's a stenosis which can be done by a CT coronary angiogram, as well as by cardiac catheterization, referred to as a diagnostic coronary angiogram. A diagnostic coronary angiogram 
is really thought of as the gold standard. Now let me take a second here to just emphasize that in patients undergoing cardiac stress testing, exercise is a preferred stressor because it provides additional prognostic information, including functional capacity and hemodynamic response. So it's always preferred. Exercise is always preferred. Nuclear stress testing compares blood flow in the myocardium to diagnose ischemia. And the last point I want to mention is stress testing with imaging is indicated in patients with an inability to exercise, or they have contraindications to exercise, or they have baseline electrocardiographic abnormalities that would preclude interpretation of an exercise EKG result, or indeterminate findings on an exercise EKG. We haven't talked about this, but patients can have what's called a left bundle branch block that does not allow us to interpret the EKG for myocardial ischemia. Or they may have significant ST segment depressions such that they're not really able to assess if there are further ST segment depressions that suggest myocardial ischemia when they undergo an exercise treadmill test. Now, it's really important to understand that there are many factors that contribute to coronary resistance to blood flow, which is a limitation of anatomical assessment. So when we're using a, a coronary CT angiogram or even cardiac catheterization, if we see a stenosis, let's say, for example, 70% or maybe as low as 40%, we don't know for sure if it's producing myocardial ischemia. So let's talk a little bit about that. Here in this example, we have an irregular stenosis where there's blood flow from here down through the vessel. So an irregular stenosis that undergoes a pressure drop due to entrance effects, friction loss, and zones of turbulence accounting for separation energy losses. These are not components that you need to understand. As I mentioned at the bottom of the slide, this is not on you simile step one, but it's important for you to understand being a physician. And there will be indirect questions related to this that we'll talk about shortly in the remainder of this lecture. So there are many factors that contribute to a pressure drop across a coronary stenosis that ultimately results in myocardial ischemia. More specifically, the drop in pressure across the stenosis is due to the length of the stenosis, the area of the stenosis, compared to the reference area, meaning the normal diameter of the, of the vessel. It's obviously related to coronary flow and coefficients for viscous friction and laminar separation. So there are many factors that contribute to coronary resistance to blood flow. Now finally, let's talk about this slide, the evaluation of suspected coronary artery disease. So this is a table taken from the American Heart Association guidelines on the management of patients with suspected coronary artery disease. I think the take home message for you as a second year medical student is in this portion of the diagram here. So if a patient has low pretest probability for ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease, then the appropriate Stress test is a standard exercise EKG, so exercise treadmill test. So exercise treadmill test for a patient has low likelihood of ischemic heart disease. A patient has low pretest probability. Now a patient has intermediate likelihood for ischemic heart disease, again, that exercise treadmill test is the right choice. Now a patient has intermediate high pretest probability for coronary artery disease, then we're going to think about stress imaging. That's going to be a treadmill stress echocardiogram. It's going to be the treadmill cardiac spec study. But you want to remember that some patients aren't going to be able to, to exercise. So if patients can't exercise, then we're going to move over to this part of the diagram here. And we're going to think about stress testing options in a patient that can't exercise. So there are plenty of stress imaging options here, as we talked about in the previous slide. You could think about doing a cardiac MR with a vasodilator stress. You could think about doing a nuclear stress test. You could think about doing a pharmacologic stress echocardiogram. Like 
we are not going to emphasize this as much in this course here. We really want you to pay attention again to this portion of the slide. Now some key points I want you to think about are choices about diagnostic testing should be made using shared decision making involving the patient. So it's very important in, in the treatment of a patient to involve them in the discussion, a concept I refer to as shared decision making. It's also critical, it is critical that a resting ECG be done in patients without an obvious non-cardiac cause of chest pain. So if a patient has symptoms that are clear-cut musculoskeletal, then perhaps the EKG is not needed. But in clinical practice, performing a resting EKG is invaluable. And so that's another key thing to pay attention to. And patients who present with acute angina should be categorized as stable, unstable angina. So let's go back to this diagram. So if you have a patient that has suspected ischemic heart disease, you need to first rule out that they are not having an acute coronary syndrome. You gotta first rule out they're not having an acute coronary syndrome because if they are, then a patient is going to need to receive appropriate therapy for an acute coronary syndrome. So if you see a patient in clinic, it's really important to exclude the possibility of an acute coronary syndrome. Then you wanna do a comprehensive clinical assessment of the risk including personal characteristics, coexisting cardiac and medical conditions, and health status. So you're going to think about the patient's pretest probability for coronary artery disease based again on age, sex, and the clinical characteristics of that chest pain syndrome. You're also going to think about other risk factors, such as whether they're a tobacco user or whether they have a family history. But again, you're going to assign pretest probability for ischemic heart disease in the way that we describe, based on age, sex, and the clinical characteristics of chest pain. And then of course, if a patient had recent exercise or cardiac imaging studying information, you're gonna use that if, to help make a decision about whether you need a repeat stress testing. And then the next question becomes, are they, is a patient able to exercise? If they're able to exercise, then you're gonna go down this part of the algorithm, as we've already talked about. And then is the resting EKG interpretable? Because if the resting EKG is not interpretable, then you're not going to be able to rely on an exercise treadmill test. You're going to have to think about stress imaging. So that's also described here in this um, diagram. The green refers to class one recommendations. So these are things that are, are evidence-based with a lot of data to support it. Class 2A recommendations, not something that we really want to emphasize are things that we should do uh, sometimes, but not all the time. And lastly, exercise stress testing is always preferred to pharmacologic methods if possible. I've said this to you now five times in this lecture, so it should be very, very obvious. Forgive me for emphasizing this point over and over again. So what did this patient undergo? This patient underwent a treadmill stress echocardiogram. So shown in this figure is sort of the setup, where obviously you have a treadmill, you have a computer that is connected to that's producing a, a continuous printout of the EKG, and then you have the echocardiogram machine that allows us to generate the images, and then you have a bed the patient needs to lie on to, to develop, excuse me, to get the resting EKG and to get the resting echocardiogram images, as well as the stress echocardiogram images. So let's talk about a terminal stress echocardiogram in more detail. So, a resting EKG and echocardiographic images need to be obtained. Patients exercise on a BRUCE protocol, which involves a continuous 12-lead electrocardiogram. The treadmill increases in terms of grade and intensity every three minutes over seven stages. Blood pressure is checked at each stage. Meanwhile, the ECG is monitored for any ST segment changes, arrhythmias, or other abnormalities. We're really paying attention to see if they are ST segment depressions, at least one millimeter or greater, uh, and that will suggest myocardial ischemia. At peak stress, stress images are obtained. And then in the recovery phase, the ECG continues to be monitored as well as blood pressure and heart rate. 
If a patient develops significant ST segment depressions, we want to confirm in the resting phase that they resolve before the end of the procedure. So as I mentioned before, the patient, this patient was referred for a treadmill stress echocardiogram. He was able to complete six minutes and 32 seconds and reach stage three of the Bruce protocol with a 12 lead ECG shown here at peak stress. He developed non-limiting chest pain during the study. That means he did develop chest pain during the exercise component of his stress test, but he's able to continue forward. So I'd like for you to take a moment to try to interpret this ECG in the same way that you interpreted the resting ECG. Now, we would not expect you on our midterm exam or final exam, or even on step one, uh, to be able to interpret a exercise ECG, but I think it's good practice to get in the habit and to remember that everything that you already learned in this course, as far as the algorithm that you follow to interpret ECG, can be used here as well. So cutting to the chase, this patient has horizontal to upsloping ST segment depressions of at least 1.5 millimeters in the inferior leads and at least V5 and V6. So I want to point that out to you. So if we look at leads 2, 3, and AVF, you can see here, if we said this is the baseline here, which is typically a line you draw from the T wave to the P wave, um, you see that there is very significant ST segment depressions. And we're not just seeing it on one QRS complex, we're seeing it in multiple, and we're also seeing it in multiple leads. And then we're also noticing it in leads V5 and V6. Here it looks more horizontal to upsloping, where here it is clearly horizontal, to some degree upsloping in lead three here. And so this test is diagnostic or consistent with ECG evidence of inducible ischemia. So ECG evidence of myocardial ischemia is present on this EKG. Now I want to point out something that we did not emphasize in the actual TBL session in, in, in person, is that the localization of the EKG abnormalities do not suggest the coronary artery involved. So I'd like to say that again, that an exercise ECG the location of the abnormalities, the location of the SC segment depressions, do not indicate the coronary artery involved. Another component that we really think about is what's called the Duke treadmill score. So using that patient's exercise time, six minutes and 32 seconds was the duration he was able to go, punching in the max SC segment depressions he had, and whether he had no angina during exercise, non-limiting angina, or exercise limiting angina, we can punch that all in and we can actually calculate his Duke treadmill score as being negative five, which means he's at moderate risk, which means his one-year mortality being a male is 2.9%. So let's actually look at briefly the equation. So the Duke treadmill score is equal to the exercise time minus five times the max XT segment depressions minus four times the angina egg index. And so that's actually how we get a Duke treadmill score. So your score is considered low risk if you're greater than or equal to five, your moderate risk if you're between four to negative 10, and your high risk if you're less than or equal to negative 11. So now, Let's focus on the images associated with the patient's study. So this is a, uh, the echocardiograph images at rest. So we have a resting phase. And so we have a, what's called a parasitic long axis view. So if you can see here, this is a left atrium. This is a mitral valve. This is a left ventricle. This is aortic valve and the aorta. And this then represents the anterior septal wall, the posterior wall, and the apex. And in these images, you can see that there's normal contractile function. Let's now move on to what's called the apical four-chamber view. So this is the left ventricle shown here. This is the anterior lateral wall, the apex, the apical septum, and then the mid and basal inferoceptum. septum. 
And here we're seeing normal wall thickening, normal contractile function of the left ventricle. Then moving on to the apical two-chamber view, we have the anterior wall of the left ventricle, the apex, and the inferior wall. Again, this is normal. And then we have the parasomal short axis view of the left ventricle. Well, here we have actually the anterior wall, the anterior septum, the inferior wall of the left ventricle, and the lateral wall. And actually what you're seeing here is a papillary muscle. So this again was a resting images from the patient's treadmill stress like a cardiogram. Here now is a stress phase. We'll give it a second to load up the images. But what we find here is that in the parasternal long axis view, that actually the anterior septum now is not contracting as well, as well as the apex. Now when we go to the apical four chamber view, we see the anterior lateral wall as well as the apex is not contracting as well as it did at rest. So this again is that in the stressing phase at peak stress. So we're seeing that because of an inadequate blood supply to the myocardium due to a coronary stenosis, presumably there's decreased contractile function. Then the apical two-chamber view, looking at the anterior wall, we see the same problem. And then the parasternal short axis view, to the same degree, we see that the anterior septum and the anterior wall are not contracting as well as they were in the resting phase. So we're going to put all this information together to say that the patient had inducible wall motion abnormalities at peak stress characterized by severe hypokinesis of the entire anterior, anterior lateral, and apical walls of the left ventricle. Now, I want to make an important point, which is not something that you need to be too focused in on as a second-year medical student, but the wall motion abnormalities here obviously localize to the coronary artery involved. The exercise EKG does not. The exercise EKG does not localize to the coronary artery involved, but the echocardiographic images do. So the next question becomes, what is the diagnosis? So we've hinted at what the diagnosis is, and so the correct answer is stable angina, which is sometimes referred to as stable ischemic heart disease and based on the most recent European Heart Association guidelines, chronic coronary syndrome, but most commonly stable angina. So we want to put physiology to clinical practice. The question becomes, what are risk factors for coronary artery disease in this patient and in general? So take a second to think about this. This is a question posed in quiz two of your course, to some degree incorporated in your Mr. Stanford case, but something that we really want to make sure you're well aware of. So when we think about traditional risk factors, we like to categorize risk factors as modifiable and non-modifiable. And so modifiable risk factors include hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, lack of physical activity, obesity, tobacco use. This is not meant to be a comprehensive list, but these risk factors are very important risk factors for not only ischemic heart disease, but cardiovascular disease, including stroke and peripheral arterial disease. It's important to remember that Sedentary lifestyle, poor diet, and obesity, all modifiable risk factors contribute to increased cardiovascular risk and increased risk for diabetes. One thing that really deserves attention here is tobacco exposure. Tobacco exposure is a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease, including coronary artery disease, stroke, and peripheral arterial disease. In patients who smoke, overall mortality is increased two to three times, and risk for stroke is increased two to four times. So it's an important risk factor for all of cardiovascular disease. Fortunately, smoking cessation substantially reduces cardiovascular risk within two years, within two years, with risk returning to the level of a non-smoker after approximately 10 years. 
Smokers who quit extend their life expectancy by several years. Now, I also want to mention that secondhand smoke also is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Secondhand smoke is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So it's another thing to also ask in terms of the history, the social history in particular. Now, one thing that's also important to remember because it's often asked is what about alcohol consumption? So regular moderate alcohol consumption, one to two drinks daily for a male or one drink daily for a woman, has been associated with a decreased incidence of cardiovascular disease. Because of the known deleterious effects of drinking, such as alcohol abuse, liver disease, for example, the American Heart Association does not recommend that non-drinking patients consume moderate amounts of alcohol as a measure to decrease the risk for cardiovascular disease. This patient has one drink per day, which is likely beneficial in reducing his cardiovascular disease risk. At least he had mentioned that in the past. So. Um, again, uh, if a patient is not drinking alcohol, I wouldn't, it's, not it's not a good idea to encourage a person to drink alcohol. It's not, import it's not a good idea to encourage a patient to drink alcohol if, they, um, if they're trying alone to reduce their cardiovascular risk because of deleterious effects. Now, non-modifiable risk factors. That's age, sex, hereditary, heredity rather, we can't control these things. One thing that deserves attention here is that the prevalence of cardiovascular and cardiovascular risk factors in the United States does vary by ethnicity. Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have the highest rate of heart disease, actually about 19.1%, followed by American Indians and Alaska Natives, 13.7% actually for that group. Non-Hispanic whites have a risk of about 11.1% and blacks 10.3% and Hispanics and Latinas 7.8% and the Asian 6%. So although there's a wide variation in the prevalence of cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease affects all patient populations and should not be ignored in any patient. So basic to translational science is also important here. It's helped us better understand ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease. So the question here now is what other factors might contribute to coronary atherosclerosis? So take a second to think about this. So one lipid parameter that has gained a lot of attention in the cardiology community is lipoprotein little a. Lipoprotein little a consists of an LDL particle containing the usual components of lipids and proteins with a little a protein attached by a disulfid linkage to the apolipoprotein B moiety of LDL. So in red here is you have the apoprotein, apolipoprotein B100 moiety here over this particle, which then with a the disulfid linkage is connected to the little a protein, making the lipo a, little a parameter. So the atherogenicity of lipoprotein little a is modulated by pro-inflammatory factors, pro-thrombotic factors, and proatherogenic factors. These proatherogenic factors result in endothelial cell binding, upregulation of adhesion molecules, smooth muscle cell proliferation, that can be proteoglycan matrix binding, and obviously foam cell formation. So this is very similar to LDL. A neurocardic core can form, so we're starting to develop that vulnerable plaque associated with cardiovascular disease that we talked about before. It's also associated with lesion calcification. One thing that we have not emphasized in this course is that smooth muscle cells actually can become osteoblast-like cells and produce calcium within a coronary vessel. And that's how coronary calcific plaque develops. And then again, there are the pro-inflammatory and pro thrombotic components to it as well. So lipoprotein A is something that we really want to screen for in patients that are at risk for cardiovascular disease, and certainly something to think about in a patient that actually does have coronary artery disease. Now, another area that deserves attention is clonal hematopoiesis. A mutation in a hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow, as shown in this top panel, 
confers an expansion advantage that yields a clone of mutant leukocytes that appear in peripheral blood. And that's shown here. So you have a mutation that develops in a hematopoietic stem cell on the bone marrow, and then there's clonal expansion, and then it is all over the peripheral blood. The presence of these clones in blood associates with a heightened risk of atherothrombotic events with worsened outcomes in patients predisposed to ischemic cardiomyopathy. So ischemic cardiomyopathy is another term, another way of describing heart failure due to coronary artery disease. So this process can result in accelerated atherosclerosis, thrombosis, and ultimately heart failure. In fact, there's a 40% increase in risk of cardiovascular disease with a mutation in a hematopoietic stem cell. So individuals with clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, often referred to as CHIP, again referred to in, as re, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, transition to acute leukemia only at an annual rate of 0.5 to 1% as shown here. So less than 1% per year. Thus for an individual, CHIP may entail a greater risk of cardiovascular events than actually cancer. This will certainly not be on Yosemite Step 1, but something that we wanted to introduce to you, particularly for those individuals that are very much interested in hematology. Long non-coding RNAs are actively transcribed genes that do not appear to code for proteins. Emerging evidence suggests that long non-coding RNAs serve as key regulators of atherosclerosis and related risk factors. So they are implicated in hyperlipidemia, obesity, diabetes, hypertension. They also can affect vascular smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells, and immune cells. So all the usual culprits associated with the development of coronary artery disease. So long non-coding RNAs are something that will also not be tested on Yosemite Step 1, but will gain attention in the coming years. It's very important to understand that in the field of cardiology, there's rapid change always occurring. It's very important to be a lifelong learner, which is why we wanted to introduce you to the concept of abnormalities in hemopoietic stem cells, as well as long non-coded RNAs that might contribute to cardiovascular disease. Moving on now, physiology to clinical practice. So several questions to ask you. What is the physiologic basis for myocardial ischemia in this patient? Why does this patient only experience symptoms of exertion and not at rest? What are the major determinants of myocardial oxygen supply and demand? These are very important questions that you must be able to answer in preparation for your midterm exam as well as your final exam and certainly will be on Yosemite Step 1. They summarize at least four or five lectures in this course and are really important concepts that you need to be able to understand. So take a second to run through these questions and see if, you'll be, if you're able to answer them. So let's focus on this first question first. What is the physiologic basis for myocardial ischemia in this patient? So shown here are the two compartments of the coronary circulation as we've described. We have the epicardial vessels, which serve as the conductance vessels, and then we have the microvasculature, the resistance vessels. So you have the conductance vessels and the microvasculature. The microvasculature is composed of the pre-arterials and the arterioles that are getting blood to the myocardial cell. So in a normal patient, a patient with no coronary artery disease, there's normal microvascular tone at rest. However, with exercise, coronary blood flow needs to increase by three to four times. How is this achieved? Well, this is primarily achieved, as you know, by microvascular dilatation, though there is some epicardial vasodilation that does occur. Again, though, the resistance circuit is controlled by the arterioles and pre-arterioles. So when you exercise, the pre-arterials and arterioles have to vasodilate. So there's complete microvascular dilatation that occurs to increase coronary blood flow three to four times so that you have adequate supply for the demand now needed at the level of the myocardial cell. So in a patient with a fixed stenosis, distal coronary pressure is influenced by multiple factors. 
And so in a resting state, when a patient has an epicardial stenosis, there needs to be partial microvascular dilatation in order to maintain adequate blood flow in a resting state. The way I would sort of think about this is that in a given circulation for a given patient, you have a limited ability to vasodilate the microvasculature. And so you're using some of it at rest in order to maintain adequate coronary blood flow at rest. But what happens with exercise is that you're going to have complete microvascular dilatation. That needs to happen because you need to increase your coronary blood flow. But oftentimes what happens too is that you have epicardial arterial constriction. There is vasoconstriction occurring, which may cause a pressure gradient to increase even more across the stenosis. But you have to also remember that because there is a decrease in microvascular tone, there is going to be a greater pressure drop as a result of that across the stenosis. Because when you have some vasoconstriction occurring in the microvasculature, that causes this 40 millimeters of mercury to be a little bit higher. And that's why it's 70 millimeters of mercury at rest. But there also is some epicardial arterial vasoconstriction that occurs that also makes this pressure drop become greater. And so in this type of patient, they're probably not going to be able to increase their coronary blood flow three to four times. And that is why a patient develops stable angina. That is why they develop chest pain, not at rest, but with exertion. But let's talk about that more. Why does this patient only experience symptoms with exertion and not at rest? We've really gone into it a little bit, but let's go into it a little bit more. So we have regulation of coronary blood flow. So on the x-axis, we have lesion diameter. So these are stenoses, anywhere from zero to 100% stenosis. And we have norm normalized mean flow. And so in a resting state, when a, if a patient has a 20% stenosis or even a 60% stenosis, it's not really compromising resting coronary blood flow until you have a 90% stenosis. When you have a 90% stenosis, even with the microvasculature vasodilating, there's not adequate coronary blood flow to the myocardial cell. And so a patient will develop rest angina. Now, if a patient has a 70% stenosis, they will not have symptoms of rest because the coronary blood flow is adequate at rest. However, when they exercise, they're not going to be able to augment the coronary blood flow to three to four times that they normally should. And so that patient is going to get chest pain due to the fact that they have myocardial ischemia and there's not adequate coronary blood flow to the myocardial cell. But what are the actual major determinants of myocardial oxygen supply and demand? So when we talk about myocardial supply and demand, let's talk about myocardial oxygen supply first. So that's really governed by oxygen content. How much oxygen, again, is getting to the myocardial cell? This is dependent on coronary blood flow. Coronary blood flow is regulated by coronary perfusion pressure or diastolic pressure. That is coronary perfusion pressure. So the diastolic pressure, when we're talking about systemic pressure, is what the coronary vessel is seeing. It's also controlled by coronary vascular resistance. This is related to external compression and intrinsic regulation. What do we mean by external compression? Well, this has to do with a question that was emailed to you by Dr. Ezra Amsterdam, where he had shown to you various points in terms of coronary blood flow in the cardiac cycle. And so when there is, for example, systolic compression on the myocardial cell, which can be exaggerated with very high blood pressure or a high contractile state, that actually is going to result in decreased coronary blood flow. Then we also have intrinsic regulation. So there are local mediators such as adenosine and prostaglandins that help to maintain coronary blood flow. And so in a patient that does not have any coronary atherosclerosis, coronary perfusion pressure can be maintained over a wide range of pressures because of intrinsic regulation. However, that becomes lost in a patient that does have coronary artery disease. 
such that when there's major changes in pressure, because the microvascular has already vasodilated as much as it can to try to maintain coronary blood flow, that there will be major impacts in terms of coronary blood flow based on diastolic pressure. Now let's talk about myocardial oxygen demand. Myocardial oxygen demand depends on wall stress. Wall stress is governed by Laplace's law. Laplace's law says that wall stress is equal to the transmural pressure times the radius of a cylinder, so in this case the left ventricle, divided by two times the wall thickness. And so in general we want to keep wall stress as low as possible. So the way that we do that is that we're going to try to minimize transmural pressure, for example. And then obviously we would like to <clears throat> modulate the radius of the left ventricle wall thickness as appropriate. And we'll talk more about that in your heart failure lecture, how that may impact wall stress. In addition, there's heart rate and contractility. So wall stress, as governed by Laplace's law, heart rate and contractility all contribute to myocardial oxygen demand. Again, we'll talk more in our heart failure lecture about how the radius of the left ventricle as well as wall thickness of the left ventricle contribute to wall stress. So we're going to put physiology to clinical practice by asking this question, what therapies can be administered to this patient to reduce symptoms of chest pain? So this is a table of antianginal therapy taken from your textbook, Pathophysiology of Heart Disease. So there are two major goals of medical therapy. Number one, to reduce ischemia and its symptoms by restoring the balance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand. And secondly, to prevent acute coronary syndromes and death in patients with chronic coronary artery disease. And so on this table, we'll focus on antianginal therapy. On a subsequent table, we'll talk about preventing an acute coronary syndromes and death in patients with chronic coronary artery disease. So let's first talk about the first drug class of agents that can be very helpful, which are organic nitrates. So an example of this would be isosorbide mononitrate, isosorbide dinitrate, sublingual nitroglycerin. And so their mechanisms of action are that they're decreasing myocardial oxygen demand by actually decreasing preload. So they're decreasing myocardial oxygen demand by decreasing preload, and they do that by venodilatation. And so when you administer sublingual nitroglycerin or isosubin mononitrate, they're causing venodilation, decreasing preload, re decreasing the amount of blood returning to the right ventricle and subsequently the left ventricle, and in turn resulting in a decrease in myocardial oxygen demand. They actually also increase oxygen supply, and the way they do that is by actually causing arterial vasodilation, of specific coronary arterial vasodilation. So that's going to increase coronary perfusion and also it's going to actually decrease coronary vasospasm. So it's a good option in patients that have vasospastic angina. The adverse effects though are headaches, hypotension, and reflex tachycardia. The headaches are due to vasodilatation that occur in the cerebral circulation. Hypotension has to do with the fact that there is vasodilation occurring throughout all the circulation, driving the blood pressure down. And because you have vasodilation occurring, the compensation for that can be a reflex tachycardia. The next class of agents we should discuss are beta blockers. So beta blockers decrease myocardial oxygen demand by decreasing contractility, decreasing heart rate, and they do decrease wall stress by decreasing blood pressure. This is actually not listed in your text, but added to the table by me. And so it's important, again, that um, the beta blocker system, or I should say the beta blocker agents, are really inhibiting sympathetic drive. And by inhibiting sympathetic drive, it's decreasing the heart rate, wall stress, and in fact, contractility. But things to be aware of as far as adverse effects include excessive bradycardia, and patients, as we'll discuss in our heart failure section, when they have systolic dysfunction, you have to be cautious with the use of excessive beta blockers because it can result in decreased left ventricular contractile function. In patients that have asthma or COPD, chronic sort of pulmonary disease, we worry sometimes about bronchoconstriction.
There are certain cardioselective beta blockers, such as bisoprolol, that can be very advantageous in that scenario. And it may also worsen diabetic control and contribute to fatigue. Another category of agents are calcium channel blockers. And so there are two types of calcium channel blockers. There are non dihydropyridine receptor antagonists like deltiazem or verapamil, denoted by V and D in the, di in the figure here that impact heart rate and contractility as shown. And there are also dihydropyridine receptor antagonists like amlodipine and flodipine. They have no effect on, on those specific parameters. So again, um, when we talk about calcium channel blockers, they're resulting in a decrease in myocardial oxygen demand by decreasing preload by venodilatation, similar to organic nitrates. They're going to decrease wall stress by reducing blood pressure like beta blockers. They also, specifically, verapamil deltiazem can decrease contractility, and they can decrease heart rate. They're increasing oxygen supply, particularly amlodipine, by increasing coronary perfusion and decreasing coronary vasospasm. However, they're associated with a whole host of adverse effects. They can result in headache, flushing, decreased left ventricular contraction, particularly verapamil and deltiazem. Verapamil and deltiazem also can result in marked bradycardia. Amlodipine and flodipine do not do that. Edema can be a problem with nifedipine and deltiazem. And certain patients, particularly those on verapamil, can develop constipation. Another agent we want you to be aware of that is not something that we want to heavily emphasize, but interestingly is included in your text, is renolazine. Renolazine decreases the late phase inward sodium current, and in ways that we don't completely understand, is effective as an anti anginal therapy. Adverse effects related to this are dizziness, headache, constipation, nausea. We want to be very careful of looking at the EKG because this agent can prolong the QT interval. It also can be associated with liver function test abnormalities. But that's another agent that can be used as anti therapy. Now, as far as additional medical therapy that's really focused on preventing an acute coronary syndrome, include aspirin, clopidogrel, prostagol, ticagalor, statins, or what are called HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, and PCSK9 inhibitors. So aspirin inhibits platelet aggregation and therefore reduces and rele re the release of platelet-driven procoagulants and vasoconstrictors. So asthma is the foundation for the prevention of myocardial infarction and death. The adverse effects associated with this medication are, are bleeding, and in certain patients they can develop aspirin-induced asthma. Another agent is clopidogrel, which is part of a class of medications known as thionopyridines. It's an irreversible oral prodrug that has to go through two oxidation steps in the cytochrome system that inhibits a platelet P2Y12 ADP receptor, thereby preventing platelet activation and aggregation. Its major adverse effect is also bleeding. We typically use clopidogrel only in patients that have undergone percutaneous coronary intervention or an acute coronary syndrome. It's not a therapy that we simply add on in a patient that has stable angina. Aspirin is something that we would definitely include in a patient that has stable angina, but clopidogrel and prastigol and ticagalor are more therapies that we use in acute coronary syndromes. So again, clopidogrel, prastigol, ticagalor, think of these agents as agents we use in acute coronary syndromes but also patients that undergo percutaneous coronary intervention. So prostagol is another thionopyridine. It's an irreversible oral prodrug. Compared to clopidogrel, it has the advantage that it only goes through one oxidation step through the cytochrome system that inhibits a platelet P2Y12 ADP receptor, thereby preventing platelet activation and aggregation as well. The adverse effect of this agent, like clopidogrel and aspirin, is bleeding. And then a preferred agent is ticagalor, which is a cyclopental triazolpyrimidine agent. It's a reversible orally active drug that inhibits the P2Y12 ADP receptor at an allosteric binding site. It has more side effects, but again, it's a more effective agent than clopidogrel or prostagrel. Its side effects also include bleeding, dyspnea, and also can result in atrioventricular block, 
We'll talk more about AV blocks and your subsequent arrhythmia lectures. Then another foundation to treatment of patients with coronary artery disease are HMG CoA reductase inhibitors, typically known as statins. They inhibit the synthesis of cholesterol, but also stabilize plaque and improve endothelial function. So they have what are called pleiotropic effects. So in addition to reducing LDL cholesterol, as well as raising HDL and having an impact in terms of triglycerides, though in coronary artery we're really focused on LDL, it has pleiotropic effects that also can help prevent an acute coronary syndrome. The adverse effects associated with this agent include myalgias and transaminitis. Now, a new kinema block are what are called PCSK9 inhibitors. PCSK9 refers to or stands for proprotein converte septilisin kexin type 9. And so PCSK9 inhibitors are two that are now available. Our injectable monoclonal antibodies that inhibit the PCSK9 enzyme, which degrades the LDL receptor on the liver cell surface. So by inhibiting the PCSK9 enzyme, we're actually promoting more LDL receptors on the liver cell surface. And by having more LDL receptors on the liver cell surface, you're going to have more binding of LDL and you're going to move more LDL from the circulation into the hepatocytes. Let's come back to the patient. So the patient is started on aspirin, atorvastatin, metoprotartrate, and even a nitrate. Harry still continues to have angina. We would describe his angina as Canadian cardiovascular class, excuse me, Canadian cardiovascular society class three angina. And he had a high risk stress test findings. We, ha we can't ignore that. His stress, his stress test showed a large area of myocardial ischemia. Before we go on to our next question, I'd like to just review this table. So this table describes the various classes of angina as per the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. So class one angina is angina that occurs with ordinary physical activity, walking or climbing stairs. Uh, excuse me, I should rephrase that. Ordinary physical activity, walking climbing stairs does not actually cause it. So again, ordinary physical activity does not actually cause it. It's angina that actually occurs with strenuous, rapid, or prolonged exertion at work or recreation. Class two angina refers to as follows. Slight limitations of ordinary activity. Angina occurs on walking more than two blocks on the level and climbing more than one flight of ordinary stairs on a normal pace and in normal condition. Class C angina is angina with marked limitations of ordinary physical activity. Angina occurs on walking one to two blocks, for example, on the level and climbing one flight of stairs in normal conditions and at a normal pace. And then class four angina is inability to do any activity without discomfort. It's a patient actually having rest pain. So with that background and with that information that the patient is still having symptoms of his classic angina, a typical angina, despite being on aggressive medical therapy, the question becomes, what should be done next? So think about that for a second here. So the answer here is cardiac catheterization. So this is a modality I'm very well familiar with being an interventional cardiologist. I do this every day. This is a cath that is shown here. A patient lies on the table. We use fluoroscopy where we generate x-rays from the bottom here that are then captured on the image intensifier, the detector, and then displayed on a large LCD screen so we can make an analysis in real time about whether a patient does have evidence of significant stenosis associated with coronary artery disease. So when this patient underwent a coronary angiogram, we used a radial approach. We have a catheter inject, excuse me, we have a catheter engaged in the left main coronary artery. We have the left anterior descending artery that should be coming down as shown here. And then we have the left circumflex artery here with the various obtuse marginal branches. One cannot ignore that there is disease in the obtuse marginal branch as seen in what's called the areocaudal view, but it is not in the range of severe. Nor do we see significant wall motion abnormalities associated with 
this vessel in this location. Here's now another view where the culprit will be very obvious, where we would see the left anterior descending artery coming down here, but it has a very high grade stenosis. In fact, it's an occlusion, a 100% stenosis. This is another view of that coronary vessel, again showing the left anterior, left anterior descending occluded here in the proximal mid segment. Now this is a catheter engaged in the right coronary artery where, again, there is disease here, but there's nothing severe that should produce myocardial ischemia. But what you'll notice here is that there are tiny collateral channels that provide the left anterior descending artery with blood supply. And you can see this here in the RAO view as compared to the iliocranial view, where through septal perforator branches, there's filling the left anterior descending artery. And this is probably why this patient in particular did not develop chest pain at rest. This patient had 100% stenosis of the LED and yet did not have symptoms at rest and that's because the patient has collateral blood flow that is providing adequate blood flow in a resting state. But when this patient exercises, this collateral blood flow is not adequate. We know that when a patient has an occlusion of a vessel and is dependent on collateral blood flow, it's still functionally a 90% stenosis. These collateral channels are not adequate, as demonstrated in this case. So what we considered in this patient was percutaneous coronary intervention, in other words, stent placement of the left anterior descending artery as shown in this illustration. So the way this is done is a wire is placed beyond the area plaque. That wire then is a rail to advance a catheter that contains a balloon and a stent. That balloon is then inflated over which there's a stent which expands the stent and the wire and balloon are removed and that stent remains in place for the rest of the patient's life. So using very sophisticated techniques with expertise we have here as interventional cardiologist at UC Davis, I was able to use an anti-grade wire escalation technique and use several different types of specialized equipment to be able to pass a wire across the seclusion of the left anterior descending artery and ultimately place a stent. And this is the final result on the aleocranial view where clearly you can see now there is flow of the anterior wall to the apex. And again, this is the left anterior descending artery supplying the anterior wall, providing diagonal branches to supply the anterior lateral wall, and then obviously heading towards the apex. And that's why in this patient with exercise, with his treadmill stress echocardiogram, we saw that there was decreased contractile function. There was simply not adequate blood flow to those portions of the myocardium at peak stress, which is why they were not contracting as well. This is just another view of the scent we've implanted with a restoration of blood flow. Now, I'd like to take a moment here to talk about coronary artery bypass graft surgery, or CABG. CABG is the most common cardiac surgery operation performed worldwide. CABG surgery entails grafting portion of a patient's natal blood vessel to bypass obstructed coronary arteries while the patient is put on a cardiopulmonary bypass machine. So this is a cardiopulmonary bypass machine that's doing the work of a patient's heart and lungs while the bypasses are being implanted. So two types of bypasses are illustrated here. We have the left internal mammary artery, which originates from the left subclavian artery, so it arises here. And so it goes to the chest wall, and it gets rerouted, in this case, and is anastomosed to the left anterior descending artery, distal to the obstructing plaque. So if the obstructing plaque is here, we're bypassing all of that to implant the graft here. Now the second type of graft is called a saphenous vein graft. So the saphenous vein graft is harvested from a patient's leg, and so one end of a saphenous vein graft is sutured to the proximal aorta as shown here, and the other end to the right coronary artery, again, distal to the stenotic segment. So it's important and worthwhile to mention that the internal memory artery, often referred to as the internal thoracic artery, 
has very special properties that prevent it from developing atherosclerosis. So one of those properties, it has a discontinuous internal elastic lamina. And the second part to this, it has a relatively thin media with multiple elastic laminae and the absence of a significant muscular component. It's by having these properties that this patient, or this vessel, I should say, this vessel, if a patient undergoes bypass with the vessel, does not develop atherosclerosis within it because of these properties. Moreover, compared with all other arterial and venous conduits, an internal thoracic artery or internal memory artery shows increased production of anti-inflammatory and vasoactive molecules, particularly nitric oxide, which cause it to have a good long-term patency. So cabbage surgery has been shown to be the most effective revascularization method for several categories of patients affected by coronary artery disease. So when we look at the 2012 American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guidelines for the diagnosis and management of patients with stable ischemic heart disease, we want to remember that cabbage to improve survival is recommended for patients with significant, meaning a 50% or greater diameter stenosis of the left main coronary artery. So again, a pa if a patient has a 50% or greater stenosis of the left main coronary artery, cabbage should be performed in that patient. It will improve their survival. And this is a class one recommendation based on level B evidence, meaning multiple randomized control trials. Another scenario where cabbage surgery is very important is as follows. Cabbage to improve survival is beneficial in patients that's significant meaning 70% or greater diameter stenosis and three major coronary arteries with or without involvement of the proximal left anterior descending artery or in the proximal left anterior descending artery plus one other major coronary artery. So what we're getting at here is that if a patient has significant three vessel coronary artery disease, whether there's involvement of the proximal left anterior descending artery or not, that patient would have a survival benefit by undergoing cabbage surgery. However, if a patient has two vessel significant coronary artery disease, then we're looking to see that they have at least involvement of the proximal left anterior descending artery plus one other major coronary artery. Why do we have such stringent criteria? It has to do with the fact that cabbage surgery is shown to be beneficial when there's a lot of myocardium at risk. If there is significant disease in the proximal left anterior descending artery or the left main coronary artery, we know that there is a large, a large amount of territory in jeopardy. So that's the reasoning behind those recommendations. So finally, we've got into the take home messages. First and foremost, the ECG is an indispensable tool in the management of patients with chest pain that can help to quickly diagnose coronary artery disease. But remember, a normal EKG does not rule out coronary artery disease. I also want to emphasize that whenever you interpret EKG, remember our mantra. Remember, think about rhythm, heart rate, intervals, mean QRS axis, chamber enlargement, Q waves, ST segment or T wave abnormalities and compare to a prior ECG if available. This is something that you should do in every ECG you see in a live patient, but also the approach you should take on any examination, whether it's step one or any exams in this course. It will serve you well by being thorough in looking at this EKG this way to make sure that you are really getting all the information you can from the EKG. Another key component from this lecture is regulation of coronary blood flow and the balance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand not only explain the physiological basis for myocardial ischemia, but it also helps explain the basis of antiangial therapy. If you can think of antiangial therapy in terms of physiology, you'll know what agents you need to use. Another factor that I actually didn't emphasize in the lecture, but I want to remind you of now, is that risk factors do not predict the likelihood that a patient's chest pain is due to coronary artery disease. 
and said they are used to help determine the likelihood that an asymptomatic patient will develop coronary artery disease. So for example, if a patient is presenting with classic symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease, meaning that they're reporting a sour taste in the back of the throat that occurs within a 30 minutes of eating, a burning sensation, as we've talked about previously, and they have <clears throat> diabetes, they have high blood pressure, it doesn't mean that their chest pain syndrome then is more likely to be due to coronary artery disease. That's not what we're saying. You have to put it all into context. All we're saying is that risk factors are used to help determine the likelihood that an asymptomatic patient will develop coronary artery disease. They don't tell you that the chest pain is more likely to be due to coronary artery disease. I hope that point is clear because it's a very important one. Percutaneous coronary intervention and cabbage surgery are two options to mechanically relieve coronary artery obstruction, which are typically used when patients fail medical therapy and stable angina. So remember, percutaneous coronary intervention and coronary artery bypass graft surgery are two great options to relieve mechanically coronary artery obstruction and the schema associated with it. But they're always done in the background of medical therapy. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this lecture. I hope this lecture helps solidify a lot of the concepts that we have really emphasized in terms of ischemic heart disease. I hope that you do well on the exam. I'm confident you will if you've done your adequate preparation. I think that if you've done quiz one, quiz two, the Mr. Stanford case, you've read through the relevant contact in your textbook, you've attended class, you've watched these lectures that you will perform well. Please do not hesitate to contact me if I can be of any further assistance. And as always, feel free to visit my website as listed here. They may provide you with additional resources to help you better understand cardiovascular disease. Again, thank you for your attention. I'm confident you'll do well on the exam if you put in your the adequate work.